usually professors are trained to speak for one hour, but I will not take, I take 58 minutes. Okay. This exercise which I thought that it is a vacation period and uh, of course the weather is also very gloomy so we should do something more to ignite a little bit of fire against those people who are preparing for their entrance examination or so. I have also seen actually some people have given their UGC also and there are a lot of challenges that so I thought that let me uh, <coughs> call them and uh, see whether in vacations also students are interested in education or it is only vacation. So I have titled you know paper this uh, uh, this paper uh, Professor E.K. Kuhn's writings in sociology paradigms and perspective. You know that uh, Professor Uman uh, has been in profession for 52 years now and we regard the 21 years back or he super animated in 2002. Uh, well, we have been joined two years back only and he retired. Uh, but there is a biography and you can read his biography uh, through his workography, the book uh, Trials, Tribunals and uh, Tribulations and Triumph. That is one. And the second part is from Bharat to India, Asia publication. So you can read that. But he was born in 1937, uh, 22nd October 1937, and super elevated in 2002. Uh, you know, uh, I also wanted to uh, look at my interaction with him and when he was teaching us sociological thinkers part two, in which he taught us Durkheim and Pareto. And I still remember that he used to bring the original texts issued by the library and they are red color, you know, at that time the binding used to be red color. I don't know what was the significance of the red color, but it used to be red color. It said a lot of things. And he read word by word, verbatim from the text, I he used to feel that why he is actually reading at that time. Then when I myself became a teacher, then I re realized that how much it is so important to read in the classroom so that the students also read. Because the students have now lost the nag of reading the original. I still feel that they have lost the touch of reading originals and that to at ML level. PhD you have to read because you have to review the literature, you have to do it anyhow. But I have uh, not found many of my students reading the literature and therefore he read uh, and uh, many times we also found him sitting in the library. We used to come to the library in the evening and Professor R.K. Jain and Professor uh, Woman sitting. So you know, we were all ashamed of ourselves that put these teachers are sitting and we are not coming to the library. Second thing is that, you know, uh, we used to chat with him in very informal setting after the conferences and seminars. In the evening there used to be very good get together and there he used to tell us very lucidly something, whatever we ask, he never denied. And, uh, you know, after that, uh, he was there also in my selection committee. So, he selected me as assistant professor in this sector. But, then as a colleague, when I started asking, sir, what is the formula to teach? 
or how to interact with a student, he had a very simple way to tell, burn your finger and learn that fire burns. There is no such, uh, there is no such shortcut that I can tell you that how you can interact with the students. It's up to you how to evolve and interact with the students. So many of my students who have not become teachers, they will be realizing that how they are coping with very different generation. And when he was retiring, I, I was given to read an ode by his teacher. And his teacher was YB Damle, who could not come very old. So he sent a uh, letter of appreciation, which I read. And at that time, chair was Kyar Narayan. And he made it a point that somebody, you know, because some teachers were saying that, oh, those who have very good English, they should read it. But he said that, no, those who know sociology, they should read it. So he zeroed down on me, and I read that. After that, he also edited a volume on social movements, in which he asked me for an article. I was really, uh, it was, of course, relation for me, because if a woman is asking for an article, and there were others also who were writing on the same theme, but he preferred my article and he told me later on. So this connection is there and then I, when I started approaching his writing, I found that he is the pioneer in the social movement. In India, his work goes in 1962 when he was doing his field work. And his field work is on social movement, Gramdan Pundan movement in Rajasthan. A person is speaking Malayalam, Malayali and then coming doing a research in Rajasthan, a challenging job, and he did that. So uh, some, some of the sociologists have actually given uh, this onus that some others are pioneering social movement. So as far as my reading is concerned, I contest that idea. And I uh, very, very point blankly say that Professor Uban is the pioneer in social movements in sociology as a discipline. And of course, the first book came in 1972. Uh, and, uh, you know, that further, that further uh, substantiate the argument that he is the pioneer. And the second book, you know, 1990 social uh, protest and social change that was also another that where he is trying to analyze seven types of movements starting from Dalit movement to uh, 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 tribal movement to you know other types of movements agrarian movement of course is there so. so in that sense there is a lot of enough material to prove the point that he is the pioneer of social movements in sociology. And he had a take, you know, why sociologists should be doing social movements. He says that historians have done the movements which are terminated. Historians usually engage with terminated movements. Now, once, you know, terminated movements are there, there is an epistemic basis of it that only victors write their movements. Who will write the movements of the downtrodden? And therefore, he says that sociology has an edge on the historians because they can write from both the perspectives. Because they only study ongoing movements. And in ongoing movements, they can also talk to the downtrodden, the excluded communities, and then also from the perspective above. In that sense, you know, he has a rash name to study. And I was attracted towards that when I was doing my PhD. And of course, uh, rest is that I try to uh, take a lot of definitions of social movements, typologies which he gave, the hierarchy of movements he has given. I think that was enormous. Now, having given you a little bit of this anecdote, uh, the other part of biography is very important that, you know, he has been always a 
asking his uh, uh, students and of course the colleagues about their well-being. It's not that, that he was only talking about academics. He will always talk about and he never missed any opportunity to come to social gatherings organized by the teachers and we know that actually that how he just heard about India Janma and came on his own that whom I want to part of it. And he went for the funeral as well, but not only funeral, the birthdays also he, he never used to miss. Or never misses is still. Hmm? Now uh, other thing is that he has been contributed to the institution building. And institution builder, not only the center, because he is one of the pioneers of the center, but Sociological Society of India and uh, of course the World Sociological uh, con Congress, he has contributed his bit and also regional, uh, regional groups of sociology, Kerala Sociological Society or any other regional uh, sociological society and he was responsible for creating 29 uh, uh, these committees, research committees in sociological society. Now actually everybody is there. So he has contributed there as well. Uh, he is one of the most prolific writer for sociological bulletin as well. He has written the maximum number of articles. That's what he said. Now having said this, let me uh, come to his uh, main you know, argument which I want to make is his methodology and epistemology. You all know that uh, I have a little bit of understanding of this because I teach this course also. So I was very much interested in his methodology and epistemology. Well, uh, we can look at how he defines methodology first and then we will come to uh, epistemology. I have done in this paper but for you, just to give you, uh, if you have seen the philosophical dictionaries on methodology or through philosophical dictionary of methodology, <coughs> so methodology uh, refers to philosophy of science which ask at least two or three very important questions. One, is social science a science? That is what methodology is asking again. Is social science is a science in the same way as the other material science or life sciences or natural sciences are? And second philosophy dictionary talks about that is objectivity possible? in the social sciences in the same way as the natural sciences have. Now Oman highlights that the uh, social scientists differ drastically in their methodologies. And in his one of the latest texts which is 2019 edited concept Indian uh, society uh, concepts, he tries to look at that look uh, these uh, social scientists, for example Durkheim gave prominence to society and therefore he is societal determinist that's what woman says that he is societal determinist when I teach I call him as uh, methodological holist because he is talking about holism. He is not talking about individuals. He is talking about society as a whole. Uman Argo also argues that Marx has given prominence to econ economics and therefore he is considered as economic determinist. And Weber has given uh, preference to individual, therefore he is methodological individualist. But he also says that 
in India, we have found uh, many of the social scientists, they conflate nation state and have become, you know, nation statist. So they try to look sociology through a national perspective. When I look at Umar and his work, I find him that he is very close to the time. And he is, you know, uh, societal de determined. Whether it is, you know, charisma and change, uh, whether it is actually state and society, whether it is uh, different forms of colonialism, he is always looking at the society. So I find him there. Now this brings me to another point, and that is epistemology. Again, I will, you know, look at the philosophical uh, dictionary part first, and then I will come to what actually Uman says about epistemology and how he looks at Indian uh, social sciences epistemology. So epistemology can be defined, you know, as theory of knowledge from from philosophical dictionary. If we take, it is actually theory of knowledge. And its central questions are, one, the origin of knowledge, how knowledge evolves. Second, uh, the place of experience in generating knowledge. What is the place of experience? How knowledge is generated. And third, place of reason. On the one hand, experience, and on the other hand, reason. So there is, in, from experience emerges empiricism, and from reason, rationalism. We all know that how later on, uh, you know, Immanuel Kant combined reason and experience and says that knowledge cannot be produced only by experience, it cannot be only produced by reason, but we have to combine experience and reason both. The fourth point actually is that relationship between knowledge and certainty. What is actually relationship between knowledge and certainty? And last but not the least, uh, there is a change in the knowledge system, the way you conceptualize society. So conceptualization of society, on the one hand, will give birth to different types of knowledge production. So knowledge, conceptualization and knowledge production are related in principle. So if we see this, you know, with this philosophical dictionary definition, and uh, we can equate with Ted Benton, Ted Benton, three sociologies, he talks about that sociology asks three questions. One is nature and scope. So, Ted uh, uh, Benton says that actually, you know, epistemology asks three important questions. One, it talks about nature and scope of knowledge, what can be known with certainty and what can be left to faith and opinion. That is one question epistemology asks. Nature and the scope of knowledge, and I will see this in Uman's you know, uh, writings that what is the nature and the scope of his knowledge later on. So that's why I am trying to underline nature and the scope, what can be known with certainty and what can be left to faith and opinion. The second aspect is that the second aspect is, what is the proper source and foundation of knowledge? What is the proper source and foundation? Similarly as, you know, Dictionary was talking about, the source and foundation of knowledge is either imprecism, experience, or either it is rationalism, or it is proper failure. <laughs> And third thing about imprecision is that evolving the criteria to distinguish what is scientific knowledge and 
what is non-scientific. So the third aspect of epistemology is that you evolve a criteria. Or lay out chai, but that kind of push your pini line. You're not taking tea? Chalo, second round with the English. So the third aspect is that you evolve a criteria to distinguish what is scientific knowledge and what is non-scientific knowledge. And we will see that how Kumun tries to evolve the criteria. Now in this whole scenario, Kumun says that epistemology relates to the issues how to choose a research problem, how you choose a research problem. And second, evolution of one's concept and theoretical framework. You evolve a, uh, a concept and theoretical framework. And third, interaction between empirical research and conceptual formulations. There is always an ongoing uh, relationship between conceptual framework and theoretical framework and your empirical reality. You have to judge that and this can be done only through epistemology. Now, what is more important uh, which a uh, woman has put it in this uh, aspect epistemology is he is trying to qualify empiricism and he says that empiricist uh, or a empiricist is constantly engaged with uh, social reality, conceptualizing social reality uh, and how he tries to engage with the social reality it is through the concepts and his theory he is not blank he is trying to understand the social reality through his concepts and through his theory but he is not trying to change it impressists are engaged with that but they are not trying to change the theory or change the concepts they only try to observe okay now with this lens when we come to indian sociology uh, woman tries to understand this epistemology uh, and says that in 1930s and 40s first of all there has not been a single social scientist or sociologist who has given a overarching methodology to understand Indian society neither they have given a epistemology there are different social scientists sociologists they have tried to look at it now from 1930s and 40s it was Indology which was dominant in Indian sociology. I think everybody knows it. And especially because actually the origin of sociology where it originated. 1950s and 60s, there was total rejection of the Western sociological concepts and theories, and people wanted to have it nationalist agenda nationalist conceptualization they created actually freedom and Swaraj together with uh, with the nationalist agenda and third uh, there was also cosmopolitans at that time I will come to uh, who were the cosmopolitans but before that 1950s and 80s he says that Indians Sociology was rarely informed by the theoretical framework of the Western or European mind. And those who tried to use it, they could not use it because there was Indology which was dominating so much. Now that brings me to the uh, cosmopolitanism. Who were cosmopolitans according to Kuman? Kuman says that uh, there were actually sociologists in India who rejected the Western concepts lock, stock, and barrel totally. 
they rejected the idea. The second stream was nationalists, those who were actually talking about evolving their own indigenous categories. And third were cosmopolitans. So who were these cosmopolitans? He explains that there were a sociologist who thought about that there is a dispassionate community of social scientists in the world and although they come from different civilizations and cultural contexts but their combined effort can produce objective science to study society. So they had faith in the international sociological or social science community that they are dispassionate and they are producing a scientific reality through which we can study. But soon they also realized that you cannot accept their theories and concepts as it is because part there is you know good for Indian society but part is not at all actually conducive. So they partly rejected and partly accepted. They are cosmic politics. And if I look at with this, Uman calls himself as cosmic politics. His book Alien Concept and Indian Realities, Asian Reality, I think will give you further insight. Alien concepts and Asian reality. Now coming, uh, now going from here, uh, that he calls himself as cosmopolitan. Let me come to the another part of his epistemology, and that is his nature and scope of his uh, nature and scope of his knowledge production. I have tried to look actually from my own uh, understanding, I may be not 100% correct because I am a small fry in sociology and at the time I am looking at his work, but what I look, I have found actually four, uh, four very important paradigms in which he has produced his knowledge. First is local, and I will give you the example of the local. Then it is uh, national, and third is uh, continental, various continents, and fourth is global. Now, coming to the first, the um, Local, I have found this uh, uh, article apprehending social reality in a hierarchical society, a rational for a perspective from below. Hmm? Apprehending social reality in a hierarchical society, the rational for a perspective from below. I think you know this is a very, very apt example of local understanding of reality. It is not only that people will start thinking that they can be only Dalits who are perspective from below. Belows can be anywhere in the world. It can be universally applied. The Belows can be applied world over. But here I am taking example because I read it when I was actually dealing with the Dalits. As well. So, he begins actually theorizing, and I can say that, apart from Professor Nanduram, he is the only sociologist in India who has tried to theorize perspective from view. I have not read yet anyone. I may be, I stand corrected when I come to, you know, later on I myself have tried to do that. That's a different thing. But, and, you know, he has tried to differentiate between tribals, proletariats, women, and Dalit. And he tried, tried to argue 
uh, that how this perspective emerges. But before that, he tried to look at that woman says that Dalit consciousness is qualitatively different from proletarian consciousness. If the proletarian consciousness is essentially rooted in the material deprivation and caste consciousness is mainly anchored in status deprivation, Dalit consciousness is complex and compound of com consciousness that encapsulates deprivation is stemming from inhuman condition of material existence, powerlessness and ideological hegemony. That means there is cumulative deprivation of the uh, Dalits and that's why he takes it to the local level. But what is more important that how this production of knowledge takes place. And here I see a tinge of uh, sociology of knowledge which comes to his sociology. He says that this perspective is crucial. Why? Because the process of production of knowledge and the advantage and disadvantage in a mating from one's location in social structure is inevitably interrelated. That means location of a researcher is intertwined with the production of knowledge. You cannot dissociate. And I have elaborated with Bordeaux, I have elaborated with uh, Paulo Freire and also uh, biography, history and their interaction like C. Dyke Mills, all have tried to argue and they have talked about that how location of a researcher contributes in the construction of consciousness and out of which production of knowledge takes place. So some people have accumulation of cultural capital and some people have deprivation from the cultural capital. So those who produce from accumulation of cultural capital, they usually side with the hegemony and with the structure. And those who produce knowledge against from the deprivation, they try to negate. And that's what I think Uman is trying to highlight in this local paradigm. And I, I quote from him. He says, I quote, perspective from below by underlying in its use, he asked the question, the purpose of producing knowledge. According to him, oppression and perpetuation of hegemony and institutionalization of equality and justice are two uses of knowledge. One, you perpetuate hegemony and second, you institutionalize equality and justice. These are two functions of knowledge. And he says that the view from above, and I quote, aided and abetted oppression and hegemonization. The perspective from above has aided and abetted oppression and hegemonization, the view from below can and should provide the much needed antidote to this facilitating the institutionalization of equality and social justice. So that means perspective from below is looking for equality and social justice rather than actually monopolization of power. Therefore, therefore, I think this paradigm of understanding the reality at the local level becomes a very important paradigm in women's writing, which I have yet to read anywhere else. This brings me to the second uh, paradigm, and this is national paradigm. And women is of the view that sociologists of India have been able to provide a specific framework for the study of Indian society and uh, you know I have just told you that like what happened in 50s what happened in 80s but what is important to uh, see us is that he has studied in Mumbai what was the Bombay orientation what was Baroda orientation 
what was Lucknow orientation and what was the orientation in Delhi University there and what happened in Jain. And in Jain, I would like to say that he said that it was de-anthropolization of sociology. In Center for the Study of Social System, actually in Delhi University, that was more social anthropology which was being practiced. And in ANU, in CSSS, there was de-anthropolization of sociology. But what is more important is that sociology in India, in, in, in his one of the articles, sociology in India, a plea for contextualization. That is the article, sociology in India, a plea for contextualization. Woman argues that if sociology is to be relevant for India as a discipline, it should endorse and its practitioners should internalize the value package contained in Indian constitution. The value package contained in Indian constitution. If they really want to make sense, Though there are different interpretation of the value understanding enshrined in the Indian constitution and the values have originated in different parts of the world. But what is more important is that these very values are widely endorsed everywhere in the world. They have become universal values and therefore they are being accepted everywhere in the world and therefore he concludes, I quote, Indian sociology can be, can and should play a critical role in the process of national reconstruction. You know that how he was writing in 1970s and 80s. So there was this process of national sociology should play a role in the national reconstruction through the process of contextualization is a part of its commitment to the broader human concern. So if they have this, then and then only. And that is why he emphasizes, and I quote again, it is my submission that it is possible for sociology to play a vital role through the process of contextualization and to prove his point of contextualization of sociology, he says that how nation as a category has evolved in India. And I will just deal it later on that how he has tried to conceptualize seven types of notions of nation in the Indian world. Nation was not conceptualized only in one way. There are seven ways in which nation was conceptualized in Indian society. You know, I teach this article in my course also. Having said this, actually, that local and national. Now I come to the continental paradigm. And in continental paradigm, woman has argued an intrinsic, uh, intrinsic relationship between conceptualization of the world and the paradigm of production of knowledge. How the world was conceptualized. So in the beginning of the, uh, say, 15th or 16th century, the colonization was writ large. The world was actually conceptualized in different types of colonies. Later on, it was conceptualized as modernities, how modern world is evolving. So during conceptualization is the beginning when he is trying to give the origin of sociology in different parts of the world. Now, if I look at this, uh, Uman says that uh, if you want, there are two very important essays which can be read directly. One is changing modes of conceptualization of the world changing modes of conceptualization of the world, colon, implications for social research. That is one. And second article is internationalization of sociology, a view from developing countries. Now, 
Now we all know that you know sociology was born in Europe, and of course Uman agrees with that. But what is more important for look at how after evolving in Europe it was transplanted to different parts of the world, and in that context, Uman has tried to argue that the sociology in colonial countries followed a very different trajectory. It was a colonial transplant and a child of imperialism. So sociology is not grown naturally in the colony. It was a transplant of imperialism and colonialism. Second important characteristic of this, uh, you know, transplant is that the colonial middle class was artificial. According to Pullman, in colonies the middle class was artificial. In Europe. Middle class emerge out of revolution, French Revolution, English Revolution, or American Revolution. There, it was a gradual, a gradual development of middle class. But here, he is saying that it is basically a uh, artificial because the colonialists arbitrarily liquidated the older middle class. Whatever middle class existed earlier to the colonialism, they liquidated. In India, money lenders, they were considered, or even the sepoys, they were middle class. Uh, the wazirs, all was liquidated for them artificially. And therefore, this middle class, which was artificial in nature, it emerged to help the colonies, basically, the colonial masters. They help them to develop and retain their course. So in this context, if you look at that this nature of colonialism was developing, there are four trajectories of colonialism, a very new uh, intervention by a sociologist that we have studied colonialism as a monolithic whole. And he is saying that there are four types of colonialism. One, you know, he looks one trajectory in North America, uh, which includes uh, uh, US and Canada. The second trajectory is Latin America. I'm sorry, sir, I'm taking your territory also. <laughs> so he is an expert in European. Uh, society. So, Latin America was the another trajectory which includes actually two realms. One is Spain and Portugal and another is of course the Brazil and uh, Argentina. And the third trajectory was African nations and fourth tra trajectory was Asia and South Asia. Now, here we see Uman is talking about four trajectories of uh, colonialism, but here again he goes into that these four can be restricted to two types of colonialism. <coughs> One is retreatist colonialism and another is replicated. Those who have been my victim, they know this terminology. Uh, so retreatist uh, and replicated. Now, if you look at the replicative first, what happened in uh, America, what happened in Canada, what happened in Australia, or what happened in, uh, in New Zealand? It was total replication of the European society. <coughs> Though they were migrants, but the language, whether it is English, or religion, whether it is Christianity, it is totally same as Europeans are. And therefore, you know, what Umar is trying to argue, that though they were colonies, now we see that they have become centered themselves, that those who are producing American sociology on their own. So Euro-American sociology on the one hand. But what is important for to note, which I think Umar has 
and not looked into. That how European concepts they have overpowered American sociology. And I am reminded of one of the you know thinkers like Gordon B. Morgan. Gordon Morgan, in his uh, book, uh, yeah, towards an American sociology, towards an American sociology, questioning the European construct. That is the name of full name of the book. Towards an American sociology, questioning the European construct. Now he says that how European concepts have been dominating in the American sociology. Just to give you one example, he talks about feudalism. Now feudalism in Europe has a history of 1000 years. It goes to Greek and Latin as such and then it came to Europe. Now, from Europe, it has been transplanted to America, which has a history of only 500 years old. And these concepts have been labeled there. And therefore, I think the uh, colonization is still there. It's not that they have become independent. And worst part comes from Joyce A. Lander. Joyce A. Lander edited volume, Death of White Sociology who argue or they argue that how whites have created supremacy of their own with their own concepts and he says that even functionalism is racist concept why because they talk about you know adaptation they talked about adaptation they talked about also uh, acclimatization and so on and so forth. So the Afro-Americans say, why should we adopt? When you create a concept, have you have you budgeted 466 years of exploitation? Or you have evolved the concept on their own and we have to abide by that? So in that sense, I think colonization, within colonization emerges, I think uh, that we can also look at. Now, sociology here in American sociology uh, has been criticized by Afro-American, it has been put on the American themselves, but there are still European remnants. The second trajectory of colony is Latin America. Now, here we can say that, you know, the deprivation is not on the basis of culture. Deprivation is based on economy, the dependent economy of Latin America. And therefore, sociology which has emerged according to Kuman in Latin America is the paradigm of center and periphery. Center and periphery paradigm comes uh, to court when we look at the trajectory of the colonialists. The third trajectory of colonialism is African population. And here, Kuman is trying to say that in Africa, 80% have one or the other European language, mainly French and English. The leading religion of the 50% of the African state is Christianity. And therefore, he's trying to emphasize that because of this background, there are new nationalist class who are trying to produce a nationally relevant, authentic sociology. So that nationalist sociology is part of American, uh, African uh, colonial, colonies, basically. Now, each nation aspires and anchors its sociology to the specificity and also pan-Africanism starts emerging there as well. Now, uh, I come to the fourth trajectory of colonialism and here India fits the bill. Now, what is more important for us that here, if we look at, it is a uh, retreatist colonialism is writ large in this area. Why? 
in colonies like South Asia and Asia, if we take the example, the countries of Asia and South Asia, they want to stick to their pre-colonial cultural patterns and language and religion. And that is why even after, even after 150 years of rule, only one, that is Philippines, is predominantly Christian and Hong Kong has a European language as its official language, according to whom. And therefore what happened, the British came here, they actually, uh, they just dispersed their some remnants and then they retreated. Now, in this context, what has happened that because, because of this reason, South Asian sociology is dominated by rejection of cultural imperialism of the West and also Western political and economic dominance. So we have our own mixed economy. We have our own way of universalism. And even we also have our own pluralism cultural pluralism rather than multiculturalism. We have to do. Now in that sense, these four trajectories are very, very important if we look Indian sociology and we can place it and we have seen that how in Japanese sociology, especially when we read Shikai Skiryong, that how Japanese sociologists rejected all the Western theories and tried to evolve their own empirical data to understand their reality. Last but not the least, I come to say that how a authentic sociology in the global age can be evolved. Woman is of the opinion that in the globalization, uh, the creative uh, aspect is conscious, uh, consciously being, you know, coming from one flow or this one unidirectional. It is coming from the West, especially when we look at colonies, there was a white man burden syndrome and they tried to argue that we have to civilize and that's where if we, uh, if, if we look at that authentic global sociology cannot be evolved. It will be a unidimensional perspective. Now if we have to evolve this perspective, Uman argues that the project should not simply be even at educating the non-Western people. You don't have to educate only, rather learning from them. You have to learn and you have to, actually this flow should be multi-directional. Multi-directional flow. I was reading, you know, another text which is emerging from Europe itself. Decolonizing the European sociology. Roderick Zettel, there are five authors who are talking about decolonizing European sociology. And European sociologists are themselves arguing that there is colonization of the white erudite males, where actually others are not being given representation and therefore we have to decolonize. Now, this is, I think, a paradigm which is important in reading Indian sociologists where we won't find actually the paradigm with which he has produced knowledge. Last part, I just want to conclude. Oh, it's already one after that. This bring me to this, uh, I think, very important aspect of human sociology. This is uh, contesting the, contesting the uh, Western epistemic dualism. Usually, woman is of the opinion that the Westerners, the Europeans have produced the knowledge through epistemic dualism. What is that? Either or all, binaries, you know, old and young, black and white, rural and urban, uh, old and young. That is the way they have produced knowledge. But Uman is trying to argue that no, there is also trichotomy and there are also continuum. In India, it is not rural and urban. 
there is Schreiber also. How will you justify that actually? And there is no abrupt rural and urban. There is also a space of continuum. So he tries to contest that, you know, trichotomy and continuum. And third, he is also trying to uh, contest the displacement syndrome in the Western epistemic model. So you can say that he is trying to contest epistemic dualism and displacement syndrome. What is displacement syndrome here? He says that in the onward march, according to Westerners, in the onward march of social transformation, one reality replaces the other. When the modernity will come, tradition will be replaced. That is what the construction is of the Westerners. But according to Uman, no, it is not actually, you know, uh, total, uh, say, displacement. There is partial rejection, there is partial acceptance, and there are occasional accretion. Now, because of this, I think, you know, very few sociologists in India, woman is the only one I see who is votary of multiple modernities. He is not, because he is not ready to take the notion of epistemic dualism, he is not talking about that modernity is a unified, unilateral development. Rather, there are multiple sources, epistemic sources of the development of modernities. And that's where he tries to talk about, and I will give you only three. He's talking about the first world modernity, the second world modernity, and the third world modernity. Now, it is not that actually woman is trying to argue this only on empirical data. He has theoretical basis for analyzing multiple modernities. What is that theoretical basis? He says that even founding fathers have not been able to evolve the totality of modernity. They have only talked about partial modernity aspects. So he says Durkheim talked about modernity on the basis of social differentiation social differentiation, there is modernity. But the problem is that he says that differentiation has occurred in the world even without difference, uh, without actually modernity. Like in India, there is social differentiation without modernity. This hierarchy, this differentiation of caste, that was there. Then the rationalization as the project of modernity given by Max Weber. So, woman is trying to argue that it's not that rationality is there writ large. Once the rationality will come and everything, irrationality or non-rational or emotional will be wiped out. They remain there. And who can as Indians are seeing it now? The third, history-making project of Karl Marx. And Uman says that Karl Marx was talking about only class orientation. But recently in the global world, we are talking about new social movements, which are not class-based movements, which are very different type altogether. And what he is talking about, modern life by Simon, George Simon, where intrinsic value is not what you are. Intrinsic value is what your product will get which car you use, which bungalow you live, all that will be considered as the intrinsic value. Now therefore, there is theoretical basis of evolving multiple modernities and there are empirical basis on the basis of which woman has evolved the multiple modernity. The first world modernity came out of industrial revolution. The epistemology the basis was industrial revolution. And what was the outcome? There was distinct division of labor in the society. 
economy, polity, and society, civil society. Economy, market, polity, the state, and civil society, family, and other. But in the second world modernity, it was out of enlightenment, that is ideological revolution. The basis was Marxist revolution, which we're talking about. But what happened? What the result? Result was that instead of three institutions, there were only two institutions. Market and state merged together. So whatever actually state decided could be produced and you have to wear. And there was civil society which was relegated to periphery. This is the second world model. Both were modern. But the first world looked down upon the second world modernity. They said that, look, you are not segregated. You have not segregated the institutions. There is combination. And the fourth world modernity emerged out of revolution against colonialism. And here, we instead of trichotomy in the first world, dichotomy in the actually, you know, second world, we had four institutions together. The state, the market, the private sector, the civil society, and the public sector. The state and market both merged together. So we had actually a very different type of notion of mixed economy in the third world, that is India fits the bill. Now in this context, we just try to look at the process of globalization which is taking place in India now. Binaries have been diluted or have been deconstructed. Now displacement is also been getting deconstructed. Woman is saying that you know you are talking about the global the, the globalization. There is a global era. There is actually unidimensionality. There is a global village, one world, one culture, and what not is being talked about. But that is not true. There are four into one process. One is one process is homogenization with a click of button. You can be having JNU, Jahanabad, Johannesburg can be actually approached from here. Anywhere actually with one click of the button. That is homogenization. What is available in actually US as Apple and here it is available. McDonald's is available everywhere. There is homogenization at one level. But there is a process of pluralization also going on. Democracy is in US also and democracy in India also. But what is the nature of democracy? And therefore, the tradition and modern is existing side by side. I keep on giving my example in the classroom that, you know, uh, what is happening, we love jeans, we love t-shirts and minis and minors, but what not. But during marriage, on the occasion of the marriage, red sari and sherwani, sherwani and safa by boys, what is this? Is that you keep on eating McDonald's, Kentucky, and whatnot, but Dal Chawal is different. Huh? Or, but Pan is different altogether after that. So, there is this pluralization which is taking place. The third is traditionalization. Is there how traditionalization takes place once the book, once the onslaught of the uh, global culture comes, the local identities will threaten. And they started asserting. They are not a passive recipient. They started asserting. And this assertion can take place 14 February, Muscle Romeo's on the prowl. How can you Archie sell Archie's? Archie's is spoiling our culture. And just close this. What are you doing? So I think that traditionalization starts emerging. And fourth is, of course, hybridization. MTV, Hindi pop, Punjabi pop, jeans with kurta, hmm? what lot? So high or vegetable burger, McDonald's vegetable burger. Burger is not sold without ham and beef. So we have taken out very simply there and put our aloo kitiki and made it. Oh, and then that has become that has become a status symbol. I don't know because you know that who ate. McDonald's burger in US and who is eating here? Now this is this has happened according to women because culture has two parts. Culture cannot be understood as monolithic whole. It has two parts, material and non-material. And we all know that material culture travels very fast, non-material slow, and there is bound to gap 
there is a bound to be a lag between the two. Therefore, there is a question of availability. It is available everywhere. But can we really afford it? And affordability will bring in accessibility. I can cannot afford actually. How I will be having access? So the question of availability is there, but affordability leading to whether it is accessible, even if it is accessible, whether it is adaptable or not. I think these four A's have tried to look into that how <coughs> multiple modernities have led to questioning the uh, displacement syndrome and therefore a new reality has been produced. I have actually, you know, a uh, very long uh, side of this, but I will stop here saying that that reading um, uh sociology will give you a very different notion of a South Asian sociologist who has partially contested